you are listening to them and to what you feel and to what's called up inside of you. Um, I give gratitude to all the writers and to Frick who made it possible for us to share this work with you on this platform at this time. If you don't have a copy of the book, copies of the book are available at the gift shop at the Frick and at bookstores around uh, the city of Pittsburgh and soon to be around the world. Um, giving a special shout out to our editor and our, uh, my fellow publisher, Disha Filia, who is long listed <laughs> for the National Book Award. Award, thank you which thank is you. so special um so y'all getting to see her before oprah gets her so y'all <laughs> pay very close attention because they come in the call giving a shout out to alana williams who is um who will share special news i'm just gonna let everybody share their own special news but giving a <laughs> shout out to um everything that uh is happening in the lives and in the creative work of the human beings who are with us here today so opening your heart and opening your soul and preparing yourself to not just be entertained and to be um a listener but to be an active participant in co-creating the moments that we are in right now. And to begin, I am going to, um, we are going to begin and open the space with the words, the voice and the vision of Christina Springer. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Disha. Thank you so much, Frick Museum. My name is Christina Springer. I am a text artist here in Pittsburgh. I show up, I do what the spirits say do, and it all seems to work out fine. Uh, I'm gonna do two poems for you tonight. Uh, the first one was recently published in Sam Sunny Away, so I'm very excited about that. Um, and I can put the link to that in the chat uh, when I'm done. Also, uh, really excited that a new screen poem of mine uh, given the circumstances, is part of Corvid Ensemble's uh, Say It Loud uh, video coming up uh, for the next till December, and you can find out more about that later. Uh, I write screen poems. This is, uh, you'll hear two of them tonight. First one's called Transient Light. A night manager accepts the moon's detrius fills and empties her. In battered women's West Virginia, my shelter is deep, down the hollow's gaping crack, past trailers like lice, crabgrass on blocks, rust-scabbed trucks and battered rebel cars too proud to properly give up or die. They run. These women with their children see some TV PCA drinking gourd and one anonymous midnight call later, twists my feet down tar into the secret dark meeting place or trap. Anyone might linger after happy hour mixes up hate's intoxicating spirits. My blood too thin for shadows, womanist words richly bewitch, skin triggers hillbilly fingers. I prefer the limping women. Groaning from the safe locked back seats of police cars arriving sullen like cat burglars surrendering prized heirlooms safely handed over at my front door intricate fractures delicate hematoma internal scars going back before that first womb delivered wound transient light i greet you you are in there somewhere love you like I love myself. A night manager wrestles her tenebrous and thick rage into a sweet like molasses. One feral caramel girl, Harriet, refused underwear, squatted anywhere to evacuate, snatched food from the table, ate behind the door like a rat, always watching, twitching, clever for life. No slave narrative could explain this broken three-year-old, observed her white father laugh, shotgun sighted, her mother waiting for him to yell, run, nigger bitch, run. Gunpowder, eardrum dance, later heavy musk sinks under the moaning bed, 
creaking sorry, shuddering love. This child listens, watches, and learns. Transient light, I love you, terrified eye peeking out, see you like I see you. A night manager throws open her darkness like thick, fat love arms. Harriet's legs thrashed, arms flailed, throat reddened, emitted scratches rather than screeches when I hauled her stinking, dripping body to the toilet, caught runaway food-snatching hands, held her in a chair as her neck, puppy-twisted, thrashed. Fierce incisors ripped my arms, clamped down, and tasting blood, she bit harder. Do it again. You are in there somewhere. I love you, I croon to her rolling eyes. Her teeth tear me again. Do it again, I laugh. Somewhere, you are in there. I love you, I repeat. Do it again, I love you like you love life. Harriet bit and bit enough temporary crimson crescent tattoos to quiet, slump, Release to sleep in my sing-song whispering arms. I love you. I love you. You are here now. I whispered, loving her enough to break her again. Loving her to wake ready to learn to toilet, to sit, to eat, to play. I prayed, transient light, drift down. Love her a suit of armor. Let her see it like I feel my heavy own. Let us manage the night. Let us eat and never be eaten. Let us howl and hold back the beasts. Thank you. And the next poem I'm gonna read is called Holy, Holy, Holy. And it's a little bit of a departure. It's another screen poem. Holy, holy, holy man, I love you, sang the gust of wind that knocked her out of the sky to land in the sand by her mother's surging side when the tide was high enough to wash her towards a man she thought could understand how her fettered freedom could unroot and uplift them both. Dirt holds, sand thinks. Dirt holding up a frenzy blooming field doesn't think about the fragile flower sacrifices raging to seed and whether or not they were ever clouds or sea foam in a previous life. It just holds them in place until the next natural drama. When the soul experiences trauma, it gets knocked up to a half inch out of the body. Like when oranges rot on the ground beneath the still blooming tree and everyone bes is beside themselves with promises and death. But magic doesn't care about any of that and neither do most men. So when her hands selected a penis shaped ginger root at the market, she didn't notice. Her heart had been put in the freezer to keep fresh with whatever circling fruit flies ready to maggot in so many inconceivable places. A change in diet seemed imperative. It was not necessarily careless. It just seemed to be that everyone was full of beans lately and they may as well just join in. Which would explain why her autumn upton hands plunged that ginger root into a honey jar, set it to the side and forgot about it. If she had been inside of herself, she wouldn't have done that. Not even when the whole wheat noodles listlessly lay in a colander set inside a cream bowl to reserve the starchy water to thicken the bean soup, because meat in this moment might be met with further violence. Cleaved, unfeathered, and left to appease some agitating elemental fury. She didn't go for all of that, and it certainly hadn't helped. So the next time she went to the market, a positively thick hunk of rope runs, rump roast boldly displayed itself to her with such firm, 
red flirtations, she remembered feasting. Except by this time, the honey crystallized, the ginger shriveled into an unrecognizable wrinkled husk. So she ground it to dust to season a roast. She fed him with those perfectly round roasted white potatoes he seemed to love so very much. And the next day, she reconfigured the beef into empanadas. And on the third day, she served it again as a hearty two-faced open sandwich on crusty white bread. It was coded language. Magic. Dust. It didn't help. He lost his taste for meat. The pot spit black at the kettle and then said, sorry for that. Butcher paper grandmothers stopped banging tender into tendons. Frostbite made icicles on the Ziploc baggie around her heart. She heard the meat hammer ask a knife about the invention of sausage and then mention husbands in the same breath. How could I ever get this kind of satisfaction, she thought. Tofu has no gristle or muscles to grind. To chop the carrots into gold coins, I must think once and twice a time comes to pass when the innocent curries revenge. I have a sharp ask. How spicy are you? She whispers at the chickpeas. Then into the phone, unbend and blend, ruminate three times. Yeah, yeah, it really went down that way. He lost his taste for meat, put the muscles in a marinade, get back to me about how it all turns out. Between the busy, the mess, the next composed face, hiding regret, the body will let you in on secrets you forget when every conversation passively tests the listener to determine whether she jests or is angrily pecking away at this test about keeping it cool. She burned herself cooking breakfast, so she snatched her heart out of the deep freezer and thrust her finger into the right ventricle to soothe it. Momentarily soothed, she wrapped it in cotton floss like a juju bag and forgot about it like the memories it should have bound. But the body remembers things. Underneath the fingernail on her index finger, a mango blossom colored bubble blistered. Eventually the skin dried into the shape of the man she thought she knew she loved. So she bit it off and spit the husk into the toilet, sprinkled some tobacco, poured some rum, the urine of a white pussy, and flushed. Up the street, she heard machetes open many coconut heads. Watching the water whirl around the bowl, she asked the painting of Frida Kahlo on the wall, I wonder what would happen if I spread my legs the way monkeys throw mangoes at the gardeners who kick palm fronds to the curb like Peter. Would we have a Holy Ghost, Hosanna, Black Madonna love moment? Frida did what Frida always does, smile like the river what tossed them both in the air. Everything continued to change the way nothing really does. Swings, merry-go-rounds, bumper cars, massage noir, the lost Easter egg, found pretty, pastel, malodorous, and merrily malignant. It was a windy afternoon. Some sun blew her to the seashore the same day all the grandmother doilies escaped from armchairs to dance together on the sand in a celebration of stretch marks. Sand is not dirt. It thinks about everything. It's always on the move, doing something, getting advice from the weeds, sand and pebbles. It thought about her. She attached herself to a palm tree. The Gulf Stream licked her spiky petioles. She felt sexy again, so her head Horse to the sun carpet on the ocean solidified. The waves seemed like they were about to make good on an urgent, long forgotten promise. She blushed and hid her smile behind her hand, fluttering. I can't believe the waves know so much about me. Tell me, what salted, susurrant meaning do you dream? The ocean sang, 
I'll make you feel something bigger. Plunge that finger with the hole in it into me. Close the hole you made in your hand when you bit the dead skin that looked like him. Sent him through my sister for me to solve. She answered, someone left a dead, left a seal for dead on the beach. The seagulls feast singing, holy, holy, holy man, I love you. She notices how much that carcass looks like him these days. So she winds her gray hair around her head to hold in the crazy. And she hears people dancing on the bottom of the ocean and the sun screeches, holy, holy, holy man, I love you, and sinks into the sea. Shadows played hide and seek on the beach. Tempted, she walks towards the beat and the meat and as she shoes away seagulls to get at the seal, thinking to get a taste and float mercy into the lowest part of herself. Her heart shatters and spills all the melted sorrow it had been holding. The sand thinks to catch the water and whisk that ache into sea foam to feed the husband shouting, I love you from the shoreline to free his dirt bound feet so he can join her dancing across the beach. But his words turn into ginger flowers spinning into plumes of cartoon dragon fire which knock her soul back into her body and she blinks like a storm petrel, remembering safety, the safety of surface tension. So she looks at him, she opens her arm, but she begins to speak in starfish. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, we're on to the next poet, which is Alana, right? Yeah. So I put my um, stuff in the chat and you can see the first poem here. And I'm so excited to hear you. Yeah, that was amazing. I was like mesmerized in a whole different world. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to Frick. Thank you to Disha, Vanessa, all the readers and everybody that is joining us tonight. Um, my name is Alana Williams. I am a poet, a songwriter, performer, multidisciplinary artist. Um, and the first poem that I'm going to read is called The Bride of Peneb, which is about the mural that's on Peneb. She's the prettiest thing in this neighborhood anymore the bride of Penev, coming home after her wedding to find her friends and family waiting with eye-watering food she can't eat until she is changed out of her dress. Oak tree tinted chicken, dewy grass greens, potato salad clouds, daisy macaroni, marigold yams laid out like button downs on an ironing board. Her mother meets her at the door, groom not far behind. Smiles are the backdrop. Love is the celebration. I wonder if they have honeymoon kids and if she can still fit her dress. The bride of Penev married the groom of Penev and they had three children of Penev. Been here from penny candy to dollar honey buns, hopscotching on Graham, skateboarding on Kincaid, tagging stop signs way before the redacted came. The story of the Bride of Penev is a never ending lineage of Brides of Penev who have children of Penev. She is me before I was her, her fulfilled prophecy. Place is the narrator here. I can never just walk past her. How many of you just walk past? And that's the first poem. And the second poem is called Rico Nasty Sonnet. 
uh, Rika Nasty is a rapper. Um, and this poem is uh, after a song she made called Smack a Bitch. Rule number one, don't believe the lie that is apathy. Be the blood that we try to forget. Size up your tongue. Let it explode into shards of confetti. Feed them to the ones you love. Remember your birth as a prophecy already fulfilled. Laugh at leafy pupils. Give thanks to the moments. You can extend your heartbeat through the back of your palm across another's face. Give even more thanks for the moments you don't have to. Thank you. And next we have- Ilana, One second, congratulations to you um, for being among the inaugural Writers House Pittsburgh re residents. Oh, yes. I just wanted thank to you. put that in the chat. <laughs> Go thank ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, no, I'm just gonna say uh, that Lisa's next. Um, but yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Lisa Pickett. I am a teacher and then I also own two small businesses and I also enjoy creative writing. The piece I'm going to read for you is a poem that I wrote for the um, Pittsburgh Neighborhood Guidebook, which will be coming out soon, I believe in March. And there are also a couple other ladies also on the panel that also have pieces coming out soon. So we are all excited about that. But this um, particular piece focuses on my childhood and how um, during my childhood, I lived in the projects, very adverse, a lot of adversity. But every once in a while, I go see my grandmother who lived in Crafton Ingram. So this just is, um, the poem reflects my experiences on how, because I had come from such adversity, when I went to Craft and Ingram with my grandmother who had a house, it was like Disney World to me. So it's just me kind of reflecting back on what I thought was just so amazing. But as an adult, I look back and I'm like, wow, it was really just a park. But at that age, it really meant a lot to me to spend time with my grandmother and realize there were things outside of the adversity that I was experiencing. So this is called Craft and Ingram. Running parallel, Steuben Street, Ingram Avenue. Don't matter because they both lead to the little, lost, lonely, bow-legged, brown-skinned girl skipping down Maxwell Street, Ingram Avenue, Negley Avenue, Stotts Avenue, and Walsh Road. The whisper of that mysterious, mesmerizing wooden park, her name finds her feet planted firmly in its crisp, bright green grass, gasping for the next calm breeze to brush across her face, swinging, swaying, Swiftly, pump, push, pull, higher and higher, adrenaline taking the lead, leaping, letting go, flying through the trauma, the tears, letting go, letting go, letting go. Bam, solid landing on the foundation of familiarity. Grinning as the little splinters filled with laughter prance on her fingers dancing to meet the beat of the dirty leather softball soaring high in the sky as it greets the call of the sun's mitt, catching the exhilaration on the next CIT championship. She inhales, itching for the calm of the craft and pool to wash away those childhood insecurities. Splish, splash, strawberry shortcake ice cream bars, wet swimsuits, $2 white lawn chairs, french fries with ketchup and cold Pepsi. Bare toes tickled by the brown ants sneaking by. Tiptoeing past the yellow jacket guarding the crosswalk as she skips over Steuben Street to Ingram. Then she goes to Ingram Days, holding the tight, holding the tight to a bit of togetherness and the crunch of that bright red shiny candy apple sticking to her palm. Crafton celebrates, pulls her away, and secretly hands her the last sweet fried funnel cake with vanilla ice cream on top. Just before the mesmerizing lights, fire twists and whirl in the air. Crack, bang, bang, whistle, boom. Silence. Calm. There it is. 
peace gliding through the air to kiss the promenade of beautiful white cherry trees reigning royally over Steuben Street as they serenade her with special, soft, silly, spectacular sprinkles of childhood. There they go marching down Ingram Avenue dressed as little monsters and witches in the annual Halloween parade, prancing back on over to Resurrection Sunday, hunting for those Ingram Park golden Easter eggs. Shh. Listen, across the way, down past Kentucky Fried Chicken and Payless, her granddad Leroy is calling her name as the scent of his mugshots cafe floating fried fish sandwich lands right on her nose. Grandma's glance on Dada's grin, cousin Chuck's chuckle, eyes watching God. The sun sets as the night takes hold. It's time to come back, little brown girl. You be sure to pull the screen door tight. No need to lock the front door. It's time for B E D. Recover. Heal, cause it's crafting, it's Ingram. It's where your childhood sleeps safely. Thank you. And now I'll pass it to Mel. I was looking for my microphone. <laughs> Hi, I'm um, Melanie Dion. I am uh, sharing a piece that I have not published, but I'm actually publishing it on Medium tomorrow. Um, it's called Everything. I'm from Louisiana, I would say, hoping that would satisfy their question. It's more definitive than the South, yes, yet less specific than the real answer. The answer that automatically contorted faces into masks of sympathy. I often find myself imprisoned in a well-intentioned conversation that would unearth all the things I buried just so I could get out of bed in the morning. Saying I'm from Louisiana gave me a shot at being seen as Melanie, a normal person participating in a normal conversation. They could love me or hate me or even forget the way normal people forget other people. It was a fragile piece that one probing question could shatter. What part of Louisiana? The lumps of lead forming simultaneously in my throat and belly would go ignored as I answered in my cheeriest voice, New Orleans. I'm no longer just some girl they met and could forget. Now I'm a resilient Katrina victim. The Times Picayune said of August, 2005, New Orleans will forever exist as two cities, the one that existed before that date and the one after. The storm became the nucleus around which everything in my life formed. What was I like before? Where did I go after? Who did I become? And the question everyone wants to know the answer to, what did you lose in Hurricane Katrina? I pause. Katrina left billions of dollars of damages in its wake. So obviously I lost possessions. I left New Orleans with three changes of clothes, my vital records, and an overdrawn bank account filling up my gas tank and the same for my two kids. Everything I answer. The word stops me and sits in my mouth so weightily I fear it break, it'll break my jaw. I can't cast it out into the universe and move on. It rests with me even now because my mind replays what losing everything means. Katrina took everything that matters. The material chunks were bearable, but how often does tragedy, tragedy stop with the tangible and replaceable? It took Gina, a girl, who, a girl whose laugh was a rumble, who always would scratch her chin before she mumbled something that was off the wall funny. Gina, who battled addiction and took turns winning and losing. She resorted to what she knew would drive out the image of the woman walking next to her through flat waters, disappearing into an open manhole cover. It took Mama's crepe myrtle tree, the one she spent years begging her mother for just a branch. The branch that sat year after year in the middle of our lawn, a laughable twig that finally bloomed in its fourth spring. It took my certainty that my mother's body, long buried, remained in the place where we left her. 
the government estimated the cost of my old life to be $10,236. It was enough for a life in Silver Spring, Maryland, and it replaced all of my material things. $10,236. This was more money than I'd ever had in my possession at one time in my life. My bank account, which should have been an answer, was just a huge question. Does it mean that it didn't happen? I just buy a new sofa and all is well. To remove from the proper or usual place is one definition of displacement. Mama would have just called it good old homesickness. One day you wake up and just feel like sitting in the corner with your knees on your shoulder until it gets better and you don't know why. You want to go home. Her words didn't make sense to me until the following year. And the more homesick I became, the more I found myself performing wellness rather than actually being well in a place that was objectively lovely, but it wasn't quite proper. Maryland was the 72 Dolphins on paper, but I'm a Saints fan. Home was and always will be New Orleans. This place I spoke intentionally of leaving. It was a place people didn't leave. And when they did, they always found their way back because there's no place on earth like New Orleans. My search wasn't for a better life. I wanted a different life. My heart desires, as the quote goes, to drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds. How would I respond to the warmth of other suns? We leave home, but home as it exists in our hearts doesn't just disappear beneath rushing, murky uncertainty. I left home in my rearview mirror on an August evening with all brake lights on both sides of I-10 leading out. I didn't even know I was saying goodbye. New Orleans has dodged hurricanes for decades. In 2004's Ivan Scare did little more than prove how ill-equipped we were for disaster. So when people ask, why didn't they evacuate, I counter, why would they? Of course you leave when a hurricane looms because nature is a beautiful, unpredictable terror. But why would this group of people evacuate? New Orleans is a city that thrives on the service industry which is predominantly the black working class. The people who can least afford a blank trip to a hotel only to get a full night's sleep in preparation for the trek back. In 2020, we still push for livable wages. So we can only imagine the type of decisions janitors and wait staff had to make in counting the cost of evacuation. And then there were the proud New Orleanians who lived through Betsy who no amount of coercing would convince. But the thousands of generationally poor New Orleanians had no, two op no true options. They could only hope for the best and prepare as they could for the worst. Home, I learned, was yet another spoil of the privileged. New Orleans is poor, often the ones who kept the cog of tourism turning those who had to stay quickly learned that they were no longer welcome. The levees broke and washed away New Orleans' defining element, her people. Everything that makes New Orleans worth visiting is created by working class New Orleanians. Millions visit annually, but only a fraction can speak of New Orleans as the living, breathing organism that it is powered by people who have very little and offer everything. Tourists love New Orleans culture and what we could do for them when they visit it. Yet those same people who adored our culture as long as they could drink, flash body, body parts, and piss in our streets at Mardi Gras were suddenly repelled by us. If we were white, we would have been something cute like ex expatriates, but since we're not, we had the pleasure of being called refugees. Americans from a destroyed American city were called refugees by the citizens of other American cities. We sat on bridges waiting for rescue and in hotel rooms 
counting pennies to ensure that we had enough to stay just a few more nights. We were refugees. We were looters. We were lawless savages who, by more hysterical accounts, had turned the Superdome into a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Our children were criticized as wild. We were all criticized as angry and aggressive. I find myself, found myself being more conversation piece and reference material than a person, answering for the behavior of every New Orleanian my conversation companion had ever encountered. I don't know Deborah, the well-meaning housing authority worker, why would a single mother who lost everything she owned and was afraid her brother's body would still be in her house when she went back home not be a great housekeeper? We were everything but we were, taxpaying citizens traumatized by governmental failure. 15, year old, 15 years later, many of us remain open wounds, neglecting treatment of the body and mind and in desperate need of healing and the media couldn't get enough of the imagery. Pornographic in its tragedy, I couldn't turn on the TV without seeing someone who looked just like me, baking in the August New Orleans sun, begging for food, for water, begging, screaming, chanting for help. It breaks my heart, the consistency in which poor Black people in crisis must indefinitely be displaced just by the virtue of the denial of basic health and safety needs like clean water, whether it's 2005 New Orleans, Louisiana, 2018 Flint, Michigan, 2017 Puerto Rico, 2020 Lake Charles. People ask how different New Orleans is in the after. After Katrina, we speak, we mourn, we live in its shadow. We do everything but seek counsel and heal. People know our story and lift us up. But New Orleanians aren't the only people affected by Hurricane Katrina. Katrina was terrible and the fury it wreaked on the coast and every state it hit on the way to Louisiana, including our neighboring state of Mississippi. Before New Orleans was punished, my mama's hometown of Sun Sunrise was uninhabitable. Each of these places are also full of poor Black Americans, displaced and, in, and suffering immeasurable loss. Why don't we hear about them? Because then you have to tell the story of the two Hurricane Katrinas. There's Mississippi's Hurricane Katrina, the terrible act of nature that let, left damage on the Gulf Coast. There's also New Orleans, Louisiana's Hurricane Katrina, that which was the storm plus a municipal failure that unearthed widespread corruption that led to the prosecution and for many plea deals of some of New Orleans' most well-known political names. Because corruption is a part of New Orleans too. All these years later, I sit witnessing the commodification and compromising of our culture, and it doesn't get less jarring. It drips off hipster lips because everyone just has to visit. But New Orleans isn't something you co-opt. New Orleans begins in the bones. It's hard drinking and hard loving. It's knowing what at least half your neighborhood is eating because it's Monday and red beans are sacrament. It's chanting girls with brightly adorned ponytails walking to the candy lady's house for a frozen cup and boys backflipping barefoot on concrete. Being a New Orleanian is having an allure that everyone sees and no one can explain. It's resilience and survival and taking New Orleans wherever you go because my gumbo is still bomb all the way in Pittsburgh. My home, my hood, my blackness deserved so much more. Whenever I talk about going back and I always talk about going back, there are people who discourage me. You tripping, ain't nothing here. And they're right to a point. I lost my mama in 1994 and daddy said goodbye and closed his eyes this year. And Joan, my mama of the last 25 years, 
doesn't want to be there anymore. But my heart is there. New Orleans has a way of holding you as collateral, and she always collects everything that matters. Thank you. Um, and now it's Jennifer. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Nicole Shannon, and it is such an honor to be here reading with this incredible group. Um, thank you so much, Vanessa and Disha and the Frick Museum. Um, I am a writer, a poet, a photographer, and now I'll say a curator because I'm curating my first virtual exhibition titled Revolt, Black Joy Still Exists, It Always Will. Look for that at Writer JNS um, in November after the election. Today, I am going to be reading a few pieces of poetry. A couple of pieces have been published already, and then I have a couple that are still looking for homes. The first one is titled Migration, and it was published in the Auburn Avenue. Migration. Trains remind me of the 20s, 30s, top hats, dresses, eyes peering from the caboose, all aboard, carving out its space amidst other sounds, flirting, dreaming, each there seeking or fleeing, taste buds itching for destiny, a great migration, west, north, storm clouds would follow. This next piece is titled Keepsake, and it was featured in the Common Threads Faith, Activism, and the Art of Healing exhibit at the Carnegie Library main branch uh, a couple years ago. Near me, she stood, picking at the skin around her fingernails, humming. She reminded me of my grandmother, eyes weary but alive, voice deep with precision, it almost made me cry, the woman's song of questioning, longing to know truth. I too began to sing, don't you see me praying? Don't you see me down here praying? My plea, like the woman's, like my grandmother's, sung at the kitchen sink, a song of asking, yet knowing, that the path wouldn't be easy, neither hard, just a reminder to find the way back home. This next piece is, again, one that is looking for its rightful place in the world, um, and I'm happy to share it here now. April 5th, 1985. His heart was always racing, always doing that thing it does when too much is happening at once. That day, mother told us not to stay outside long, to only play sitting on the step, as if we could. School had just let out, the sun still held its place in the sky. Our eight-year-old selves, excited and free, ran, jumped, skipped until his heart ruptured. Right before us, it stopped and we danced. Our feet bare, tickled and happy, softly denting the thick, supple grass, never knowing it was real, thinking somehow the game had changed. Mother knew this would be the thing that changed us, having to learn about life that way, 
the cruel things it will do. She didn't know I had studied his face. The boy in the greenhouse, three doors down. He was happy when he fell, at peace when his eyes closed. A smile stained his lips. The final piece for tonight is titled Religion. Hair is heavy. There is so much wrapped into each strand. Each time it changes, I too am slightly altered. The first time I knew it would transform me, I was seated between my mother's legs. She braided it so it would last. Beads dangled, made noise when I walked. This sacred hair process in front of the kitchen stove, in a chair at the salon, standing before my mirror raised me. Keeps me stuck in how long it is, how certain people stretch their hands out to touch it. I feel the weight of it, how it holds people hostage. Oh girl, you got good hair. Make some choke, shackle, shoot. Others call 911 while in the park. Makes me weary, the fear, the violence, the hair. One of these days, I'm gonna cut all this shit off, lose my religion, start over again. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Alma. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Good. Okay. Um, I'm Alma LeBron Rice. I am a fairy marsh monster, writer, gift economist, hummingbird, mixed media artist. And tonight I'll be reading an essay called Ancestor Reading that recently appeared in the magazine O Reader a new magazine dedicated to the love of reading, very meta, <laughs> reading about reading. <laughs> so, ancestor reading. Wait, you haven't read The Eyes of Watching God? This is an accusation masquerading as a question, leveled at me by my friend Dominique. Here we are, two college-educated Black women, the demographic that reads more books than any other, according to a Pew Research Center report. Here we are, the daughters of enslaved poet Phyllis Wheatley, the first black person to publish a book in the United States, but not, unfortunately not the last black person in this country pressed to defend their own literacy. She belonged to poetry, always, never the plantation. No matter that Dominique and I are currently standing in front of the built-in bookshelves of, of my first apartment, the bookshelves that maybe overlook the stained carpet, as well as a dingy bathroom and kitchen. No matter that the landlord, as she confided to me much later, had chosen me over other applicants because of Sonia Sanchez's poem was my outgoing voicemail message. Despite my dignity as a reader, in Dominic's mind, I'm a little lesser because I don't have Zora Neale Hurston's masterpiece under my now dubious bibliophile belt. That was almost 20 years ago. Dominique is no longer my friend. For, for probably obvious reasons. And their eyes are watching God is now a friend I wouldn't live without. But more on that later. The brightest corridors of my childhood were lined with books. My classmates called me Reader's Digest. In middle school, I won a trophy for completing 31 books in two weeks. The same year I got a D in math because books always meant more to me than grades. As a little girl, the only superpower I said I wanted was to be twinned, self-split, so that one of me could do nothing but read all day, while the second me was executing all of the other dimmer aspects of life, going to the bathroom, standing in line, doing chores. Family lore says I taught myself to read at three. The first book I remember is a picture book of watercolor blue and gray cats. What I remember most of all is trying to read it aloud to my Uncle George, who lived with us at the time. 
I was so proud of myself. Only big girls could read. But my tender heart uncle was sharp with me, surprisingly agitated when I tried sharing this big girl miracle with him. I didn't understand. This is an uncle who gifted me my very own bunny rabbit, a pet as soft and good as my uncle himself. Even now, I cringe at the memory, the sudden serration in his voice when I cracked open my book of cats, liquiding from page to page. It was only years later that I learned that Uncle George was illiterate and, that my, and my heart keened for him. How it must have hurt to see three-year-old me crow about words, which were hieroglyphs to him. I don't know what effectively barred him from learning to read and write, but I have my suspicions, him being a black farm boy in 1930s Kentucky. And I grew up on what used to be a settlement for formerly enslaved people, still majority black, so it didn't take much to recognize had I been born in the preceding century, I might have been legally barred from reading and writing myself. The United States is the only country to ever have had anti-literacy laws on its books. And South Carolina was the first state to do so. And death was the penalty for circulating incendiary literature, according to the South Carolina Slave Code of 1739. These injunctions against black reading and writing spread throughout the South, where my ancestors tended line after line of cash crop. I know none of their names, in large part because literacy was fugitive. But sometimes I wonder if my hunger for printed words can be traced to their unsated desire for them. Just as a pregnant person eats for two, perhaps I read for legion. When I read, a spectral umbilical cord can extend for me to those numberless forebears, passing along the word nutrients they should have had, had access to in life, reading as reparations. 12 years ago, I'm sitting on the floor with Nathan, a highly recommended Babalao, a priest, our priest of the Ifa Oracle. Between us, there's a straw mat upon which Nathan uses cowrie shells to communicate with my ancestors and guides. He has never met me before, yet the messages he pulls from the deeps are undeniably for me. I'm scribbling feverishly in my notebook to capture each drop of divination until one message stops my pen in its tracks. Your people say you need to, eat the, read, you need to read the eyes of watching God. He says, yes, one of the prescriptions for me was to read a book I had been meaning to read, a book I've been shamed for not having read yet. But there was no shaming in this ancestral directive, only clarity in medicine. Considering everything else that Nathan had shared in that oracle reading with me, it made perfect sense for my ancestors to advise me to read their eyes of watching God at that juncture in my life. In fact, I was grateful that I hadn't read it earlier, because then and forever that lush novel represents a love letter from the ones who authored me. It stands as a beacon of what is possible for me as a black storyteller, a student of, and a student of folklore, just as Zora was. I have not yet learned to body double, exactly, as girl me wished I could. But sometimes my ancestors, or perhaps my ancestors, and I have achieved something just as magical, reading together, time and space and their trifles. Their eyes are watching me, yes, but they're also reading with me right over my shoulder. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, when um, Lisa and the Frick reached out and said, you know, they wanted to host us, we thought, well, why don't we do one event and see, you know, maybe a few contributors, you know, have some new work they want to share. And as you know, 12 of you <laughs> had new work you want to share. And I am, I am honored to hear it and to witness it tonight. Um, thank you all. And um, we want to spend the rest of our time together um, talking to you um, and hearing from you about your process and your practice. And um, I know I, as a writer myself, I have mixed feelings when people ask me about process and practice. Um, so I hope the questions that I have for you um, are welcome. Um, so my first question, and to kind of keep this smooth, why don't we follow the same order that you read in, in your responses? So we'll start with Christina. And if you want to pass, you can pass. Um, I want to talk about ingredients. 
And so ingredients for your um, specific work, you can, if you want to talk about that, or just ingredients that you need to start new work, what are your three ingredients, if you can only have three? Three ingredients to start new work? Or that particular work you read, whatever speaks to you. Um, I don't need many ingredients. I sleep. I need a bed. <laughs> um, a lot of my work feels like it's taking dictation or that, um, or it comes out of dream work. And uh, it is not uncommon for me to have the 3 a.m. wake up call. Um, so the bed, the bed is my biggest ingredient to be open to receive the what I receive. And, and so, and then the computer, because I dump so quickly into my machine that it, it feels like a transference. Um, and then the quiet and the time to go back and try to make shape in the nonsense. Thank you. So I think it was it was Alana. I think Alana. Okay. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> uh ingredients that's the question <laughs> okay um i don't know i think i'm gonna pass <laughs> that's fine that's fine for me i would say that it would be recording of my inspiration because oftentimes I'm working or I'm being a mother or I'm doing other things. So inspiration will hit based on things that I see or that I hear or that I smell. And I'm like, okay, I gotta hurry and write this down or else I forget. And then when I go back, I need to have space to bring that to fruition, which could be hard once again when you're a mother. So I would say the first ingredient is recording the inspiration. Second is having space because I learned one thing about me as a writer is that I go into like this zone where I get so deep that I can't hear or see other things around me because I'm in that space, that creative space in my mind. So I know I need that space, especially as a mother, that if I'm gonna write, I have to be somewhere else or else I'll get very upset and full of anxiety because I've lost my train of thought because I'm that deep into whatever character or poem that I'm writing. Like when I did Craft and Ingram, I literally took myself back to that space what did I really love about craft and what are those elements that really took me to a space where I felt so safe and so comfortable? And then the third thing is like that spontaneous overflow of emotion that's like recollected in tranquility. Once again, where I'm going to this, to this mental space, which could be like, for me, like I said, it could be a weakness or strength as a writer, because I, I'm learning as a writer that I'm not always gonna have space to go to a separate quiet space as a mother Sometimes I gotta be able to do both. If I wanna write and be successful and not wait 20 years and say, oh, I'll write that when my kids are grown. I'm like, no, I wanna write it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can relate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll pass it to Mel. Sorry, I, the microphone struggles again, sorry. Um, my three ingredients are pen, paper, and music. I am very analog. So even though I will ultimately go back to um, go to transfer it to something digital, my starting point, my jumping off point always is pen and paper. Because when my phone is dying, when I'm just somewhere random, I can always write something down. And for this piece in particular, it's something that I've been playing on, playing with and tweaking for a while because of how it's from the past, but it's still very present as far as the effects that it has. And I, whenever I go back and tweak it, one of the things I always look at is how much things haven't changed. And the things that have changed have usually changed for the worse. 
So it's a difficult spot. Um, it, it comes from a, 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 a kind of hardened in, or, or, or a place that's trying not to be hardened, um, but very hurt, very angry. And um, it's always, it, it's jarring, it's jarring to me when when i'm uh when i when i revisit it initially i usually have to go back and read it go through the process of whatever emotion it evokes work through that and then update rewrite whatever and um it's sort of been a journal of how i've changed um because every year there's something different or there's something that i've either progressed or regressed on uh, things that I thought I was not angry about anymore. I still feel that. And so it's, but in the end, despite all of that, it's also very cathartic because these issues that New Orleanians are, de are dealing with are not resolved by any means. And New Orleans is not the only city who has done something like that. When we look at places where there are concentrations of Black people, we have a story like that. And it was important for me to tell it. It's important for me to tell stories like that because um, we have to keep discussing it until it improves. We have to keep acting until it improves. Chronicling it for me tells me, okay, when are we through? talking when do we have to take action steps on this and so that's the most that was how i how i made it through how i always make it through like the crafting and and retooling of this piece and the the, the thing about it again for me is that it's never it's never really over we're because what we're looking at is something that will affect us all for decades um so it's and and i i take each piece that way I, I look at where I was and how I've changed since then, whether it's something that I'm reworking or something that I'm starting fresh. Where was I then and where am I now? That's always the two most important things in my process. Thank you. My, my ingredients are really space, Lisa, you talked about it and I think about space and I think about surroundings. So where am I? What kind of energy am I receiving in that space? And I found that I can't write if I'm not in some area or space of peace in some place that brings me a level of inspiration. So space is very important to me. Uh, pen and paper, I also, like you, Melanie, I work there first and then I transfer over to the computer. Every once in a while I'll use a notepad in the phone but normally it's paper and pen and then the final ingredient is really just being open. I think Christina you talked about you know your bed as a place um, I think for me, it's just being open to receiving and to be inspired by whatever I, I should be writing or I should be capturing in the moment. And whether that's taking a walk and the trees blowing, I mean, so anything can really be an inspiration. But as long as I have those things and as long as I'm in the right mindset, something will come. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I can, a lot of my three things are echoed when people said earlier. I would also say that not surprisingly, consider what I just read, reading is a big ingredient. For me, a lot of times I use other people's words to just engine me out of a state of, I don't know what I'm gonna write about. Even sometimes I'll go to poetry readings and I'll start writing my own poem while the other person's reading and so I get in this kind of translate state. So for me, reading is absolutely essential for um, be able to write, to enter the stream of words. Um, and I'd also say a friend of mine, 
And we talk about a place called the glacier is the third, uh, second thing I need, which is, and the glacier is for all things remote, distant, the only place, the place where I'm beholden to no one's schedule. Um, I have no identity other than, or no charge other than to listen to the ancestors and to write what they had me write. So I feel like having the glacier, um, the cold, magical, remote place of inspiration is one, in, one ingredient. And the third ingredient is one that um, <laughs> it's having a lovely wife who will totally be able to cook, you know, nights like this where I'm doing the writing thing. She's so supportive. And, and I'm like, oh, is it okay if I'm not cooking tonight? You know, it's like, and so just wonderful having support. Um, I didn't grow up in an environment where my creative voice was really valued. So having chosen family where I'm supported is just, is essential. Thank you. Um, uh, some of you talked a bit about um, what I guess we could call distractions in your uh, process and in, in your practice. Um, and, and just to be clear, when we talk about process, it's, let's say that's the process of, of creating work and then practice is sort of um, the sort of habits of mind or the rhythms. So that's my definition. You might define it differently. So whatever those words mean for you. So thinking about your process, thinking about your practice, I want to ask each of you, what would you name as a distraction from your process and your practice or, and or, and how do you engage with that distraction? Um, and I, I thought about this question because I remember, um, there's a, a essay and I forget which one that Alice Walker wrote and you can just sort of hear it in her voice and she says, you know, very, um, you know, lyrically, there is a distraction from my work and her name is Rebecca. And I encounter that as a mother of a young child, a new mother myself trying to write, but I'm also a daughter. And so I was like, man, what must Rebecca think? having read that, but Rebecca is also an artist herself. So I've been very interested in this idea of naming our distractions, and it may or may not be a person for you, but thinking about a distraction from your work and how you engage with that. And we'll uh, start again with Christina. Being, being a mother, I can definitely relate to that, Lisa was uh, is i wouldn't have i wouldn't call it a just i have two children widely paced apart so my first child was my practice child and my second child was was a little bit like a do over and uh i know that's not fair <laughs> to them to say that but it's very truthful and I did view, I think, my child as a distraction the first time around because I was always grabbing at and snatching time and, and carving, fighting to carve out space. And I did it very differently the second time around where uh, I was calmer about my creative practice. And so I looked for the spaces that were most open for me uh, and there were spaces when they were most happy, when, 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 uh, when he was most happy, when he was engaged, when I had provided an activity. Um, and that eventually grew into a place where we now work side by side frequently, uh, now that he's a teenager. Uh, so I'll be doing my thing and he'll be doing <laughs> his thing and we, and we sometimes collaborate. Uh, and sometimes we're just doing our own things together. Uh, and that started, he started being able to, to work side by side with me when he was about 13. But I think it's because I invited him to be in that space with me. So that became less of a distraction and more of a, like a shared studio space, or, or I treated it more like a shared studio space. Um, and it's been good. <laughs> it's been really good. Um, my biggest distraction now as a as a more mature artist is um white supremacy and uh a few years ago 
I decided that I was no longer writing about white supremacy. And what that did for me was open up this incredible um, new influx of voices and images and, and, and vision. And, but I do, you know, in, inevitably, um, white people will white. And uh, inevitably, that means that there is a poem that we have to write about a, a body in the street or a body in a bed or um, a black body, those, those bodies that, um, Melanie, you talk about almost this harvesting of us. Um, and I feel called to speak about that because I command language, or at least I like to believe that I command language. Uh, and I have to remember that, um, that we have other narratives to advance right now. So, um, and, and this book, Tender, um, is a wonderful advancement of the kinds of narratives that I'm looking for, that I'm looking to create, um, that, that fill me as an artist. Um, and so I have to say, it is hard sometimes to wake up at three o'clock in the morning, which is another part of my practice. <laughs> I race over to the computer and download stuff. It is hard to say, I'm not getting out of bed for that poem about, uh, um, about um, Breonna Taylor, because I wrote that poem about Sharice Iverson back in 1998. That poem's been written, and so I'm not gonna write it anymore. Um, I'm gonna write new other things. I'm gonna sleep tonight, rest my black body, so that I wake up and I'm healthful and um, can create the kinds of narratives that are going to be more sustaining to us in the long time, long term. Thank you. Sorry. I went a little bit long there. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would say, um, I was talking about this today, actually. Uh, one of my biggest distractions is, uh, because I'm I'm not a mother, but I was somebody's practice child, and <laughs> and um, and as somebody's practice child, you know, I kind of grew up like half analog, half technology. So, technology is a really hard thing to um, let go of a lot of times in just my day to day and doing things. Um, we don't watch the news or read the newspaper. Therefore, we're just on social media. So it's a lot of um, really, you know, just me not minding my business. I think, you know, that's like, that's what I'm getting at is just, um, yeah, just, just not minding my business. And, you know, it's hard when we live in this world and like um, to kind of echo what Christina was saying, like, um, sometimes it's, it's more so just, uh, you know, kind of, kind of feels like a receptacle. Like, it's just like this thing that just goes around and around and around. So I think that's a really big distraction. Um, you know, cause social media is connected to white supremacy in a large way. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. I would say for me, it would be, like I said, having the responsibilities of being a mother and then also having a full-time job and then all the stress that goes with being a, a teacher, that comes with a lot of mental fortitude. So I have to just, um, the distraction is learning to remove myself from that space so that I can get into the mental space that I need to get into right successfully. And the only way I do that, the only way I'm able to do that is I have a space in my house, which is... Um, when we moved in, it was a family room, but I turned it into my office and I just put all types of things in that space that inspire me, that make me feel creative, that make me feel worthy and honored. So whenever I look around, it gives me something that I need in that moment to write whatever it is that I need to write or what, I'm, what, I'm, what I would like to develop. And then the second thing is my distraction is over editing because I'm an English teacher by day. So I tend to over edit. So I've tried to train myself throughout the years to just freestyle, just so I can get it on paper. And then I'll put it away 
and then I'll go back to it so that I'm able to, you know, over edit because I literally can revise a sentence over and over and over again and just become obsessed with it. Um, so that is my distraction, but learning to just let that go and be free with it allows me to get things done faster. Thank you. For me, um, like Alana, I do a lot of social media um, because I'm a social butterfly and I kind of a clown a little bit and I love cracking jokes and I love my one-liners and all that. And that takes time. It takes time that I could be uh, doing, dedicating to something else. And it's probably my favorite form of procrastination. But the biggest um, distraction that I really had, have, have had to contend with is grief. Um, because I, whenever I deal with grief, it's usually in packets. And it's a bunch of people who are very close to me at one time. Um, this year, in, in addition to my dad, I've lost 10 people who are very close to me. And I think only two of them were COVID deaths. So this, is, this was a very heavy year of grief for me. And it made me re-examine how I dealt with my grief, with my mother, with my sister, how I would revisit these things and relive these things over and over. And to call back to what Christina said, I've told this story. I've told this story about how my mother dying broke me down. There are no other ways that I can tell it unless I just plan to keep reliving it. And I saw how much it was stifling me in my writing, my creative process. And so I was not writing about these other wonderful things in my life. I was just in this container of grief. And it took getting to now to realize if I exist in this every time a tragedy happens, I'm going to, I, I won't be able to accomplish anything. So walking away from that, looking back at things that I can walk away from, these lessons that I've learned, these pains that I've endured, and moved on from that has been that's been the struggle that's been the distraction that i've been contending with most heavily lately thank you i think one of the biggest distractions for me outside of technology which can certainly cause me to procrastinate a bit but the biggest distraction is having multiple ideas and just wanting to do five different things or write poetry, try to start an essay, uh, do another project. And all of those things take such a great amount of mental energy. And so just realizing that I cannot focus on five different things at once. It's just something is going to fall. I really need to focus on the one thing at a time, at least for the week or however I frame my time to write. I need to really focus. I'm working on a novel now. I work on that novel and I try to make that be the, full, the sole purpose of what I'm doing in that given time frame, or else it just becomes, oh, I need to now do this and I need to now do this. And so I'm not giving anything the type of mental energy that I need to. Uh, so that's, that's been the biggest challenge for me. So I'm just writing things down and jumping in when I need to, 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 to start new work. I can relate to that as well, Jennifer, also multi-passionate. Um, I will say that one big distraction is what I spoke about in the piece, which is I don't have a body double yet. <laughs> and I have this life, you know, this other self that is not yet materialized that I want. It's not, that just could be dedicated to writing. But I will also say that um, one large distraction is something Toni Morrison said, you know, um, she wrote The Bluest Eye because she was looking for the book that she wanted to read. And I feel like I spend a lot, I've spent a lot of time trying to find the words, the writing, the arrangements, um, the constellations of words that will, so I don't have to write the thing. 
And I'm learning that I have to write this thing without any model. Yes, there are some kind of general, generally speaking, but there's a desert and a glacier I have to go onto again, it comes up again. And that's scary. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk now about black women being the blueprint and that's inspiring, but it's also um, really frightening to have a story that you want, that you've never seen in print before. You want to realize it in the world and realizing it's up to you. So I think I've distracted myself with over rehearsing, over editing, reading, even reading, you know, can be a place that I've, I've done some hiding out in. So um, lately, my, my charge has definitely been to, um, the pandemic has definitely given me a certain kind of urgency to be like, okay, this thing that you're carrying around in your head that you raid bookshelves for, it's time for you to start to write the thing that you've been longing for. Thank you. So we have time for one last question for everybody. Uh, we've had two questions come in. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a choice. You can answer whatever question you want. It can be one of these uh, two questions, or it can be to share anything else you want everyone to know about your process and or practice. So that's your first choice, sort of open-ended. You know, final words, what, what do you want to share? Um, or tell us about um, how this, the, the pandemic has impacted your process or impacted, we've talked a lot about space, you know, finding space, especially um, for folks who um, are isolating or maybe in closer quarters than before, how has um, your process or your space for your work changed? Third option, how do you know when a piece is done? How do you stop editing? So you've got three options before we say good night. Okay, um, I'm trying to hold all of that in my head. <laughs> um, the, the first thing I, I guess the closing thought I wanted to share was that um, years ago at Cave Canem, and I, I'm pretty sure I remember this correctly, Sonia Sanchez talked about having um, writing in the same place every day. And I really took that to heart uh, because she's, what she said was that when you go to the same place to create every day, what you're doing is you're, you're gathering that energy um, and that that energy lives in that space and it builds and over time it continues to grow and to build. And so I have always, <laughs> Uh, found my little nook, whether regardless of where I have lived um, for many years, it was in the kitchen right next to the stove when I was, you know, providing food service and toileting services to small children. But my, what I needed to write always lived in that one place. And that was where I could always go to, to get, to do the dump and to put the words down when it was time to put the words down. And as a, I have found as a visual artist that I was many very very frustrated for many years because I didn't have the same thing for my for my visual art, and so I carved out a little space in my house to to be a studio, and that's where I go to to build that energy to bring visual artworks into the world. Um, but carving out that space has been so important to me and. Um, makes it very, very, uh, I am often sometimes prolific in essence. <laughs> I just, I'm always up at 3 a.m. doing the dump, uh, receiving the messages. Um, so that's one thing, because those centers are there calling me <laughs> to come to them to, to put the work in. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about revision and um, I'm, I'm always revising, always the, the editor is strong in me and, um, and I, I'm blessed to have some really delightful black women who have 
mentored me in some way or another over time whose voices live in my head when I write now. Um, Toy Darakot is one of those voices. And I will sometimes step back when I'm writing and, and look at a piece and hear her saying ever so clearly, I'm, I'm really bored now. And so I'm gonna skip to this part of the poem. And so now I can look at a poem and say like, I'm really bored now, I'm gonna skip this part goes. Um, and move and move to where the work needs to be and to 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 excise the the extraneous pieces that don't that perhaps maybe belong in another piece. So I have endless files of stanzas or chunks of work that I have pulled out and just put as a little blurb in another, and I just have a constant compost piece pile that I can go back to and see what's germinating, what's ruminating. Um, so I, I don't consider a piece done until it's been published, um, which is the really strange thing because I will often I have often published and 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 I look at it and I say, well, I could really revise that, but somebody thought it was finished enough to put somewhere, and so I leave it in that way as an as a um, as an archive of where I've been because if I'm constantly remaking the poem and making it better or the piece and making it newer and better and fresher, then nobody who looks at me over a period of time will ever see any growth. And as artists, I feel that we do um, young artists a disservice to see us always in our perfection. That is a word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is a word. Yes. Old artists too. <laughs> and, and right. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that. that is, I, personally, I needed to hear that. Thank you. Um. Yeah, that was a lot. That was everything. I agree with everything you said. Um, <laughs> and, and like going back to um, the revision editing, um, I'm kind of of the same thought process. I think my work is very living, um, so I could go and build on it forever. But I think that whenever, I think a really good way to know for me when to stop is whenever um, doing too much in the poem whenever I'm just trying to like fit something in or I'm trying to like make something look a certain way and it's just like all right like <laughs> just just leave it alone um but yeah I don't consider it really done until it's published and I wanted to talk a little bit about the COVID question um in space and um I think that kind of going back to also the distraction question, um, I've really been trying hard to become more committed. I was gonna use the word discipline, but it's a commitment. Um, it makes it sound like, you know, all lovey-dovey. So I'm trying to uh, make a better commitment to my space and what that means in my space, in my head, in the space um, that my body physically takes up, my physical space, like the space around me, and also um, the space that other people take up, which is like a really, really hard thing to, uh, <laughs> to navigate whenever you just, whenever you like people. Um, so, uh, it's really just taught me um, to kind of go at my own pace and patience. Um, and I'm still learning every day, but uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I feel like I'm getting to that point where I'm starting to enjoy it and it's not so tormenty to just be still and just have, take my space. Thank you. Alana, I so agree with many of the things that you said, and Christina as well. 
for um, me as a writer, the space is definitely essential. The energy, I need to go back to a space where I've been successful. So that energy, like you said, that lives there, I'm able to, to lean on that to help me to get to where I need to be. And then Alana, I definitely connect to doing the most. I'll, I'll, when I know I'm doing too much, like I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I need some alliteration. I need some imagery. I need some hyperboles. I just need to make this amazing. Um, that's when I know I need to stop because I'm just doing the most. And I found that what helps is I put it down and I give it to someone else that I know has experience. And that really helps. Like when I worked with you, Disha, in the beginning, that really gave me a different perspective as a writer that I can't hold my pieces to myself and then expect that they're going to develop and grow if I don't share them with other people. So that was definitely an experience. I think a lot of it had to do with a lot of my writing is very intimate. So I didn't want to share it with others, but doing that helped me so that I can get stuff done. Like for me, the key aspect is, okay, Lisa, you want to write, you need to get this published. What's the point of doing it if you're going to keep it, you know, all to yourself. So now I find people that I know that um, can read it from a, from a perspective and help me to grow and develop so that I don't get stuck and just constantly revising it um, and editing my pieces. Okay. I, um, it depends on what I'm writing it for. I want to speak a bit on revision. There are times where I'm writing a story to give my knee jerk reaction to something immediately, or I'm being silly. Those things tend to sit on their own. Um, and that's kind of whatever it is. So outside of a factual inaccuracy or a misspelling, I'm probably not going to change that. Stories like the, the one I wrote tonight, um, that was, that's something that tends, that still kind of grows a bit because as long as I'm not living in New Orleans, I always have things to tell about that story until I publish it. And um, which I will be doing uh, in the near future. And that will mark the end of my editing process on that. Um, I'm one of those writers, there are writers who really cringe when they look at their old work. I don't do that because I like, um, I like looking at my growth. I like looking at the pockmarks and all the, all the things that I can't believe I said in public. Um, I can't believe I shared this. I can't believe I didn't share that. And in those stories, in the stories, whether I write um, something from a personal, because I write a lot of very personal narratives, and I write in kind of a bare bones way. I'm very honest, sometimes brutally so, and I don't stop until I've told the brutal truth. Am I not just, am I just telling the, um, the pretty side of the story? In the book, in the contribution that I wrote for Tender, I had a friend who read it and she said that this is a beautiful story. It's very pretty and your mom was dying so it does not feel honest. You can give them this story or you can tell the actual story. And then I started pulling up again um, my anger, uh, the, the hurt that I felt and all of that. Because if I had to tell that story I had to tell it right. And there were no angels in this story. We were all going through a very difficult time and we were all rough with each other. And that's what I always look for when I'm convinced that I've told the truth, then I can rest. But if I feel like I've just told the half story, if I'm still nitpicking at something, then I know that I'm still being pretty and I don't like to, I, I don't write pretty and I don't, want to. I want to write beautiful words, but I want those words to tell a very stark truth. And that is the way there is, there is poetry in tragedy. There is prose in tragedy. And that's what I like to tell when you are going through it, when you think you don't have anything left, you still have these stories and these stories that need to be refined. And so that's, that's how I get to that's how I whittle down my revision process. Once I feel that I have been honest enough that I'm telling people the actual story. Thank you. I will talk a little bit about my writing 
process and how it's been through COVID-19. And it's changed quite dramatically because I was let go from my work back in April. And, you know, at first I was really thrown off and panicking a bit and not really sure what I was going to do. And it honestly probably was, it was a blessing in disguise because it's given me the freedom to create without, you know, trying to carve out time in the beginning of the morning before I work or, you know, really having a desire to, to create and not being willing to, you know, step out and actually create. And I know that's not possible for everyone. It, you know, it's just barely possible for me, but it's, it's also shown me how much, you know, God and the universe will make space for you and you can do the things that you want to do. Uh, so I just want to really be encouraging because again, I was working, bringing home steady income, not really looking, um, not, not sure about what my writing career was going to be, but also really wanting to pursue that in a more meaningful way, not knowing how to do it. And then all of a sudden this thing happened, which has been terrible. And, you know, I'm not making light of anything like that, but I think there has been a blessing for me in that. And that it's also opened me up creatively. I'm willing to take more chances than I ever have been. And, it's just given me a freedom that I didn't have before. Um, um, and I'm so grateful for that. The, the revision piece I know is, is important for everybody, but along with like in the practice of, of how things have changed for me, I have certainly, I treat myself as if I'm working every day. I wake up, I write for a certain amount of time in the morning. I take a break, I eat lunch, I, I step away from the computer, but I do it, I do it in a structured way because not that I want to work again, but I wanna treat my craft as if I am working, as if it is meaningful enough to me to commit eight, 10, 12 hours, however much time it takes for me now that I'm not working and I am fortunate enough to be able to sustain some type of life without um, this nine to five right now. Um, yeah, it, it's important that I structure a day and I actually make this a practice. So I also am a part of writers groups and I have some of my fellow writers uh, thank you guys. I appreciate y'all. I see some of y'all out there. Um, and writing partner um, with my novel, Anavuyo, I see you. Anyway, um, shout out to all the people. But, I, you know, it's just been, it, it's, it's taught me a lot uh, just about trusting, about faith, and just about how to just step out there creatively, not worrying about what's gonna happen, who's gonna reject it, if it's gonna get accepted. I need to do things that call out to me, that speak to me, that give me the energy to keep moving forward. And I would suggest that, you know, if you're writing, you know, just do it, you know, write what you wanna write. You know, somebody, somebody is, is gonna resonate somewhere. It may not resonate where you want it, but it's gonna be, meaningful to someone and I just had to learn that and this has been a teaching year for me and a year of just stepping out. Thank you. A whole sermon. Thank you, Jennifer. I love that. It's so inspiring. Um, I um, know my piece is finished now after many years of anguish and as a recovering perfectionist. I know it I feel in my body, it's a certain click, cadence, it's a backbeat, it's something I really can't put into words. Um, and I would say that often I know I'm done when there's something I've written that astonishes my own hand, is what I say. Something that I hadn't planned, because my imagination is always bigger and better than I am. Any of my constrictions is my imagination always has something better. So when I submit to that process. I'm like, oh, okay, and go with that. Um, but this is after many years of really being tortured and having editors angry with me, um, having to go on leaves of absence of college, um, disappointing people because I was so stuck. And I remember I had this one professor who was so under, he was so lovely. 
And he was one of the people that helped me get on the other side of that. And he um, said that, you know, writing, this is a record of your process. This isn't a referendum of who you are, what you always will write. This is just a snapshot of where you are now. And that freed me up. And he also said he worked in, um, he, he worked in the Middle East and he said that um, he met a weaver, a Palestinian weaver, who part of her practice was to put a mistake in her weaving intentionally to remind her that only Allah was perfect. And so for me, this idea that failure can be baked in, failure, right? Like what would I create if failure were not this specter? Um, if I'm not afraid of looking silly, if I'm not afraid of being over earnest, if I'm not afraid of an editor not accepting my work, what's possible? And the answer is everything. So I think for me, um, once I got clear that editing, fa failure or not being perfect isn't the end of the world, I found at the beginning of all the other worlds. And I feel like there's so much to write about now. Um, and I don't even have writer's block, which is, was not the case for most of my, my life. So um, now I'm really so glad that um, living as a vulnerable being, a flawed, fallible, permeable, iridescent being is part of the beauty of the, of the work and um, it's no shame in that. So. Thank you. I want us to end with your words. Um, so I will just thank you. Christina and Alana and Melanie and Lisa and Jennifer and Alma and add that the reason Vanessa and I wanted to create Tinder is because we wanted Black women and femmes to know you can do anything you want to do and I thank you all for exemplifying that over and over and over again and thank you to um, Lisa V and to the Frick um, for hosting us and for inviting us. And I'm going to turn uh, things over to Lisa V now. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end. Um, all I will say is thank you. A deep, deep thank you to all of you for showing up and being honest and open and vulnerable and um, just teaching us, just teaching us in, with your words and your stories and um, I'm grateful that Tender has come to the Frick, um, and I am grateful that your words and your creativity and inspiration will now be, be shown to, to people who are, are part of the Frick, um, and now you're part of the Frick, and we're, we're happy. We're more than happy to have you, um, and to learn from you, so thank you very much, and we'll see everybody very soon. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you, Disha. Oh, you're welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs>